If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And we'll start reading at verse 44. Jesus is going to tell two parables here. Both have the same meaning, but they're both very powerful. And I want to welcome everybody watching online by way of archive. We thank God for our online family watching all over the world. Thank you so much. Share this right now. If you're watching on Facebook Live, share it so all your friends know about it. Matthew chapter 13, starting with verse 44. Jesus is speaking. And he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. Back in this day, they didn't have uh, banking institutions like you and I have today. So when people found a treasure, a lot of times they would go hide it. They would go bury it and hide it to keep anybody from taking it. And this is what this man did. He found a treasure. He took it and he hid it. And for joy over it, he goes and he sells all he has and buys that field. He bought the field. See, nobody else could see value in the field. But he did because he knew what he had put in the field. That'll make more sense in just a moment. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking a beautiful, beautiful pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all he had and he bought it. Today I want to preach to you a message entitled Lessons from the Pearl. Lessons from the Pearl. The finest quality and this isn't a real pearl, obviously, but it'll work for an illustration today, have been highly valued as gemstones, objects of beauty for many centuries. And because of this, the world, word pearl has become a metaphor for something very rare, something fine, something admirable, something valuable. You spend a lot of money on teeth whitening because you want to have pearly whites. I was reading that just about 10 years ago, listen to this, a Filipino fisherman made an amazing discovery in the sea off the coast of the Palawan Island, Philippines. A two foot long, and I think they have a picture of it, a two foot long pearl inside a giant clam. It looks like a piece of gum. He took it home, listen what he did with it. He hid it under his bed keeping it like a good luck charm. Recently, the tiny home he lived in burned down, but the 75 pound pearl survived. They value it at over a hundred million dollars. Good luck charm up underneath his bed. A hundred million dollars. Jesus tells two parables here. One is about a treasure that has been found and the man hides the treasure in a field and sells everything that he has so that he can purchase the field. The other one is a merchant who is looking for beautiful pearls. He is a jeweler and he finds one pearl of a great price. And this pearl so impacted his life that he goes home and he sells the business, he sells the homes, he sells the cars, he sells all of his possessions so that he can come back and purchase one pearl of great price. Now typically, as preachers, we have preached these two parables that the treasure represents Jesus and the pearl represents Jesus. You've probably heard somebody say he is the pearl of great price. That when we find Jesus, we, we give up everything so that we may go and purchase him. But the truth be told, you could never sell enough, earn enough, give enough to purchase salvation through Jesus Christ. There is nothing you could do in yourself that could ever even come close to paying the price to purchase Jesus. So if Jesus is not the treasure, and if Jesus is not the pearl, then maybe we are the treasure and we are the pearl. What if 
Jesus found a treasure in us and gave all he had to buy something that looked like it was worthless to everybody else because he knew, even though you can't see it, I put something on the inside of them a long time ago that makes them worth me laying down my life to buy them back. What if Jesus is the merchant who was going around seeking pearls and then he found one pearl of great price and he sold everything. He gave up everything so that he could come down to earth and purchase one pearl. What if I'm that pearl? What if he left heaven and earth, left heaven and all the glories of heaven and came to earth just so he could buy my salvation? Since I couldn't earn it myself, couldn't buy it myself, what if he gave up everything to buy me? I want to give you some ideas from the lesson of a pearl, lessons that we can get from this pearl. Number one, a pearl is a valuable object. Pearls can be worth fortunes. In fact, a string of pearls can actually be worth millions of dollars. The one pearl you just saw worth over a hundred million dollars. Pearls are valuable. Let me tell you something about the church. The church was worth a fortune to God. He was willing to pay whatever price necessary to purchase his church back from the enemy. He was, you was worth so much. How do you determine the value of something? I heard somebody say, you determine the value of something by what somebody is willing to pay for it. How do you determine the value of the church? Look at what Jesus was willing to pay for it. He paid a high price, too high a price, to save us from the pits of hell. Can I get a good amen? Look at what this merchant did. He recognized the value of what he had found. He determined in his heart that he was going to have it, and he sold everything to make his purchase. Jesus left heaven, left the glories of heaven, left the splendor of heaven. He left the authority of heaven. He had angels that moved at his beck and call. He had all authority. Anything he said would happen, but he took off all of his royalty. He took off all of his authority and he laid it down to be born in an old dirty manger with cattle and goats and sheep also that he could die a criminal's death on a cross. And why did he do it? He did it to purchase his church that he may have a blood bought church without spot and without. I know I'm preaching too early. I just got into it. I'm still in my introduction, but I feel this today because we have taken what Jesus was willing to pay a high price for and we've turned it into something so cheap that we say, I don't have to go to church today. I, I can sleep in today. Well, our church ain't that important to me. It was important to Jesus. It was as important enough for him to give his life so that you and I could be here today. I could think back over my life and I could thank God that Kim and I have a house. What a blessing. Kim and I have two cars. What a blessing. Kim and I have two healthy children. What a blessing. Kim and I have closets that are full of clothing. What a blessing. When we go home today, our refrigerator is stocked with food. What a blessing. When, 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 when we want to go on vacation, we have funds that we're able to go on vacation. What a blessing. But can I tell you the greatest blessing of all is knowing when the disciples came back and they said, Lord, we cast out devils. He said, what's that a big deal to you? You ought to get excited because your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. If you can't get excited about anything else this morning, you ought to get excited that Jesus died for you and you're on your way to heaven. Come on, somebody give him a praise that he's worthy of. Somebody give him glory that's due him. The church costs Christ everything. And we try to cut corners for what we'll give to the church. So let me tell you something else about the church being valuable. The church is worth a fortune to the world. Do you want to know why I believe there are some cities in America that the earth hasn't just swallowed, opened up and swallowed them whole? It's because I believe in those cities, regardless of the evil that has taken place. You want to know what I believe is holding back God's judgment on America? When we can't even pass in our halls of Congress a simple bill that says after a baby's born, you need to keep it alive? 
I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. If there's anything you should be able to get behind, it's that when a baby's born, that's a living, breathing soul, you shouldn't let it die. You want to talk about God's judgment coming upon a nation? We are, you read, go back and read the Old Testament. Read about how they worship Baal. Read how they offered their children to Baal and they let their children be burned with fire. They sacrificed their children to an, to an idolatrous God. You want to know why I believe the earth hasn't opened up and just swallowed America whole? Because they're still on street corners around this country. They may only be running about 75 average. But there are still men and women of God getting up behind pulpits and preaching the word of God and the church is praying and it may only be 75 but that 75 is the only thing holding back the judgment of God on that city, on that street, on that town. You want to know why the church is valuable to the world? Because we're that buffer between them and God. God wants to bring judgment, but we're saying, God, give us a few more minutes. I believe we can save a few more. No, no, God, don't pour it out yet. Come on, there's a few more children that need to be saved. A few more teenagers that need to get saved. A few more husbands that need to get born again, God. Somebody ought to give God praise for the church. If it wouldn't have been for the church, some of your marriages wouldn't have been saved. If it wouldn't have been for the church, some of you have never been healed. If it wouldn't have been for the church, you would have given in to depression. You would have lost your mind. But thank God you had a church where you could come together. I feel God in this place today. Give God praise for the church. Let me keep going. I got several more points. The pearl is formed from something completely worthless. Completely worthless. There are, there are about three materials that are used in the formation of a pearl. You have the offending material, which can be different things, but primarily a, a small piece of sand. What is that? Have you ever walked along the beach and went, oh, look at all this money? <laughs> no, because sand is worthless. Sand is worthless. Sand has no value to you. But that one tiny grain of sand gets in that oyster. And it begins to release saliva and calcium that coats that piece of sand. Something worthless. But then when two other chemicals get involved becomes something valuable. I got news for you. Everybody in this room, you ain't nothing but a speck of sand. Look at somebody and say, you are worthless. <laughs> you are absolutely worthless. There's a wife been waiting to get that out on her husband right there. You are What value do you have in yourself? The Apostle Paul said it like this. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And he said, even in my best, even when I do my best, my righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. I count it all. He used the word dung. Dung. Farmers know what dung is. He said, my best efforts to find worth are nothing but dung. All have sinned. But, but see, God finds that worthless thing, and he begins to release two things on it, two things called grace and mercy. And even though I came in this church worthless, he begins to cover me with his grace, and he begins to cover me with his mercy. I do get what I don't deserve, and I don't get what I do deserve. And every Sunday I come in, I do get what I don't deserve and I don't get what I do deserve. And he begins to coat me with his grace and mercy. And Malachi 3.17, he said, They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on that day that I make them my jewels. You hear what he's saying? You worthless piece of sand. But because you've been covered by grace and mercy... One day God's going to handpick you and he's going to hang you around his neck and he's going to walk around showing you off and it won't be you who gets the glory. It'll be him who gets the glory. <laughs> All 
all types of junk get in that pearl and it gets coated. Ephesians 2, 1, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. If we don't do anything else today, we need to just take a moment and remember what we were. Because all we're getting preached in churches today is how good you are. How great you are. Oh, God loves you just the way you are. I can't tell if it's God preaching or Billy Joel preaching. I love you just the way you are. Don't go changing to try to please me. Tell me that's not the sermons being preached from pulpits today. God wants you to know, don't go changing to try to please me. Because you're good just the way you are. You are valuable just the way you are. We need to have a good old service where we remember how pathetic we were. How vile we were. How decrepit we were. How messed up we were. How jacked up we were. Let me ask you a simple question. What's so special about grace if you're already so special? Do you want to know what gives grace its glory? Is how screwed up I am. When I look back over my life and I see how messed up I was and I see how much of a wretched sinner I was and I see how lost and undone I was and then I look at the grace and mercy of God, that's what makes grace amazing. That's what makes grace worth it. That's why I need the grace of God on my life because I was nothing without it. There are churches today, they would have a hard time singing amazing grace. Because that, that second line gets them amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved them. Ooh. No, let me say it loud and proud. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. If you're thankful for amazing grace, give God a big praise in the room today. Come on. Am I yelling too much? I'm yelling. I'm yelling a lot. See, it's, it's the memory of who I was that gives me the praise for who I am. People who, don't, people who can't praise God don't remember who they were. They think they made themselves good. But the loudest praisers in the church are those who remember how bad they were. been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God not of works lest anyone should boast not of yourselves we didn't we didn't have enough self-help groups to get you out of your funk it was the grace of God like that old song said I was near to despair when he came to me there and he told me that I could be free then the Savior above, from a Savior of love gave me peace from above when he reached down his hand for me. When the Savior reached down for me, when he reached way down. I like how that song says it. When he reached way down for me. I was lost and undone without God or his son. Then he reached way down for me. It is a thing. Are you having fun yet? Are you having a good time today? You might like this next point. It's a thing of unique beauty. Unique beauty. Look at somebody and say, you are unique. You are. No two pearls are alike. No two pearls. Every pearl is different. They're different in size, different in shape. And then I read something even better. 
it said, and this is from a website about pearls, it says they're available in various shades and colors. From purple, green, blue, black, pink, cream, white, and even multicolor. Isn't God awesome? I heard somebody, somebody told me the other day, you know, God's colorblind. I said, he is. Then why did he make us so many different colors? See, you think God's offended by somebody being a different color than God thinks that's beautiful. To him, it's just like he made the pearls. Each one's a different color. Each one's a different shade. And no, no two are exactly alike. Isn't it wonderful that that's how God made you and me? That we don't look alike. We're not shaped alike. We, don't, we, don't, we may not all think alike. But yet we can all go on the same necklace. You see where I'm going with this? I don't want to go to a church with a bunch of pearls that look alike. I like variety. I love it when I look out over you and I see all these different shades and all these different colors and, and people, people ask us, how in the world did you accomplish that? I didn't. This is Jesus that put this together. This is Jesus' jewelry box, not mine. He, he's the one making up this. My goodness, how boring would it be, Elder Branch, to just go to a white church? How boring. Because every song would just be slow worship. You know it. Because that's all us white folks can do is. We lift it. And it may, it may be fun for a while, but I got a feeling I'd get exhausted if I went to an all-black church. I'd be like, good Lord. Can you all slow at least one song down? I just can't dance anymore. I'm so thankful that we are made up of different shades and colors here at City Gate Church. I'm so thankful when the fast music hits, you got some people like. And I'm so thankful when the slow music hits, you got some people. And I'm so thankful when I get up here and preach and you got some people, glory adios, pastor, glory adios. I'm so thankful that we're made up of different colors and shades because this is what the church is supposed to look like. We're not all supposed to look like. We're supposed to look like Jesus. Can I get a good amen in the room? Find somebody a different color than you and give them a high five and tell them I'm glad you're here. Come on, find about three people who look different than you and say I'm glad you're here. This is every Sunday. I do, and I'm thankful. I stand up in the front and say, thank you, Jesus, that we get to do this. We get to do this. We get to defy what culture has said is impossible. We get to defy what has been named the most segregated day of the week, Sunday. And we get to move all that aside and say, no, no, no. If you lift Jesus up, he'll draw all. Praise God. I got a couple more things if you want them. Right. Here's another one. It's a hidden work. A pearl isn't created overnight. It takes time. It grows gradually. In fact, it can take one oyster up to three years to produce a single pearl. 
And this is what it said. Pearls grow hidden inside the oyster under the water. Double hidden. Can't be seen until it's ready. But the shell that you think is hiding it is actually protecting it. Because it's not ready yet. And the longer that shell covers that oyster, or the longer that oyster covers that pearl, the more valuable it becomes. Can't see it yet. Not ready yet. Not ready yet. And for those of you who feel like God's had you hiding, for those of you that God, you feel like God's had you secluded, that God keeps pulling you away from friendships you're trying to get into and relationships you try to get into. And, and for some reason, you tried to work there, but God pulled you back from that company. And for some reason, you tried to go here, but God kept you hidden back over here. And you say, God, I feel like I'm all covered up. God said, I know, because you're in a process. I'm hiding you. You're not ready yet. But I'm, hey, the longer I hide you, the more valuable you're going to be when I open open you up and expose you to the world. Look at somebody say, you're just in hiding. Watch this point. The value of a pearl is determined by how well it, it reflects light. One of the outstanding qualities of the pearl is it has the ability to reflect light. A high quality pearl will seem as though it's being, this, this, this just blew me away when I read this. A high quality pearl will seem as if it's being illuminated from within. Making it possible to see your own reflection in it. But a pearl with poor luster and poor quality features will give a weak reflection that is actually blurred. How can I tell the level of my spiritual maturity? When the world looks at you, do they see a blurred image of Jesus? Or when the world looks at you, do they see almost as if there's a light coming from the inside of you that they can't explain it? Even though you're going through a dark time, there seems to be a light coming out. And when they look at you, they don't see you, they see Jesus in you. When I go through a storm and the world looks at me and sees Jesus, that's my value. When people mistreat me and they look at me and they still see Jesus, that's my value. When I should be losing my, life, my mind and going into a dark place, but it just seems like the darker the night gets, the brighter the light gets coming out of the inside of me. And the world says, how? How are you happy in a time like this? How do you have joy? It's not me. I'm just reflecting the light of the one who's shining on me. Look at me and you'll see Jesus. Let me say this. You can be seated. I got two more points and I'm done. You enjoyed this message today? The pearl is a unity. A pearl is the only gem that cannot be cut. The second, a diamond can be cut, rubies can be cut, but the second you cut a pearl, it loses its value. Do you want to know when a church becomes worthless to the world? Whenever you divide it. Don't be the person holding the chisel. Let God deal with the church. You take care of you. But before I would ever try to cause disunity in the church, see, it's bigger than just your little problem that you have. What you don't realize is if you try to divide that church, you have just cost that church its value to the world. That church has just become worthless to the community it's in because you had a division, a different vision, and you said, I'm going to go start my own thing 10 blocks down the road. You just cost the church its value. This is why God forbid any of us would ever try to bring division in God's church. Amen. Yeah, but I've got, it's, you are not the judge of the church. Leave and go find another church. 
Go, go, just go. But don't ever sit there and try to cause division in a work. All you're doing is chipping away and the church will lose its value. But you know what happens when there's unity? God commands the blessing on it. When a church is in unity, God begins to illuminate it and it begins to reflect Christ to the world around it. And the world, the world looks at that church and says, no matter what we've tried to do, we cannot stop the moving of that church. We, they just keep growing. We keep trying to push back, but they keep growing and they keep impacting our community and impacting our culture. That's the power of unity. Unity is not uniformity. We don't all have to think alike. We don't all have to dress alike. We don't all have to look alike. We don't all have to be the same color. We all, all have to be from the same background for you and I to be in unity. We just got to make sure we're looking at the same thing, moving towards the same goal. Amen. There's one final thing I want to share with you. The pearl is a product of suffering. One tiny grain of sand gets into that oyster's mouth and it irritates that oyster so bad that that oyster begins to release a chemical to coat the irritant, to coat the pain. And it continues to release more and more to continue coding and coding and coding all because there is something in the mouth of that oyster that is hurting it. But one day that pain is going to have value. And somebody in here today is facing something painful. And God wants you to know, I let that irritant get in your life because I'm going to get glory out of it. I'm going, to make, I'm going to bring value out of your suffering. I want you to think of this for a moment. One day, hopefully, most of the people in this church is going to go to heaven. I hope all of you do. I hope to see all of you there. What a man, what a service we're going to have if we all go to heaven. I know God won't do it, so don't ask. But boy, wouldn't it be great if he gave us a city gate section in heaven, but he's not... He's not going to do that. Of course, we'd be up there like, look, it's every nation, kindred, creed, and tongue. We did what you said. You, But he's not going to do that. But it'd be cool. You die. Your spirit leaves your body. The Bible said it's appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. And one day you and I are going to die and then we're going to stand before the judgment. And if we have our sins covered under the blood, if we've received grace and mercy on our life, do you know what the Bible says that Jesus is going to say to us? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Come see the joy that I have prepared just for you. And then Jesus is going to reach down and he's going to get us. This is my imagination part now. He's going to get us by the hand and he's going to say, let's go see the city. Now, the Bible gives beautiful descriptions of heaven. It talks about walls miles and miles high made of jasper. It talks about a sea of crystal, a sea of glass. It talks about the beautiful colors, the beautiful um, um, gems and jewel stones that make up the throne of God. Get in your Bible and just read about the jewels that make up the throne of God. But Ed, do you know the first thing we're going to see? Bible says that in every side of that wall, every side of the walls in heaven, there are gates. And the gates, I used to read it, are made of pearls. And that's not correct. The Bible says they are made of one pearl. How beautiful are the oysters in, in heaven? How big are the oysters in heaven? If one gate can be made of pearl, one, one pearl, one gate. And God's going to take you and he's going to walk you through. And I almost think he'll slow down right when he gets to the gates. And he'll go, check those out. 
Why, Jesus? Because a pearl is formed from suffering. And before you go in to get your reward, I just want you to look at those gates and remind yourself that every time you hurt, it was worth it. And every time you went through a trial, it was worth it. And every storm you went through, it was worth it. And every heartache you had, it was worth it. And every time they lied on you, but, but you stayed true to the word of God and you forgave and you loved them anyways, I want you to look at those gates of pearl because it was worth it. You see, maybe he'll form, maybe, maybe, maybe it wasn't an oyster that made those pearl gates. Maybe it was my suffering that made those pearl gates. And maybe he'll just let me pause for a second so that I can dance right in the gates before I go in and dance at the pearly gates to say every trial, every heartache, every day of suffering, every sleepless night, every moment of heartache, every moment of heartbreak, every tear that I shed, I was building a gate into the city of heaven so that one day I could just dance right there in the gates of heaven and say it's all 